Hi, I'm Sam Nielsen. I'd like to talk a little bit about some advanced principles of subsurface scattering. In particular, I want to talk about some different types of subsurface scattering and how they can affect the way that you paint or render things. I use this example of a strawberry, and this is a photograph, because it has some great examples of subsurface scattering, the light that passes through the leaf, and of course the strawberry itself. One thing about strawberries is that the surface itself is not actually very red. It's mostly just a clear surface. It's all of the stuff inside the strawberry and the way the light interacts with it, which gives the strawberry its red appearance. Painting fruit can be particularly difficult because of all the subsurface effects that you have to deal with. Before we can talk about subsurface scattering, we have to talk about the difference between surface and subsurface scattering. When light comes in and hits an object, the first thing it's going to do is bounce off the surface. And as it bounces off the surface, in this case we have the ambient light of the scene, you'll get the color of the lighting combining with the color of that surface. In this case I'm also adding in a key light which reflects off of that surface in a very specific way. It's very predictable. In addition, though a little bit more complicated, you can do specular effects where the light is reflecting directly over the top of everything and giving you that sort of glossy sheen. But you may notice that this fruit doesn't really feel like a fruit yet. It has a sort of plasticky quality to it. I'm not imagining that this is a particular fruit, but even as a fake fruit, it looks fake. And that is because it is lacking subsurface scattering. With anything that has any translucency to it at all, light will sometimes pass through that surface and instead of just reflecting off the surface, it'll reflect off of particles inside that surface. And it'll change directions, bounce around a bit, and then eventually come out. As that light bounces around inside, it actually gets absorbed. The colors get absorbed, so the light takes on the quality of the color of the material inside that object, and it also gets absorbed so that it loses brightness, meaning that you end up with a sort of gradient of light moving outward from where the light runs into the surface that gets darker as you move away from where the light is hitting the surface. Now that's not the only way that light interacts with an object with subsurface scattering. Sometimes you end up with a very translucent surface, something that allows a lot more light to come through without interfering with it. And in these cases, what can happen is something like this. Here we have the light being refracted by that surface as it comes into something, almost as though it was just filled with liquid, but there are still enough particles in here to interfere with that light, to scatter it around a little bit more, and so that when it comes out, it feels like a generalized light gradient. But that light gradient may end up in a different location depending on how that light goes through. So we actually end up with at least four different types of subsurface scattering. Now there may be more, but these are the ones that I thought of to share with you today. And I'm giving these the names of high density, low density, glassy, and variable density subsurface scattering. With high density subsurface scattering, you just get a soft glow right around the edge. This is the result of the material just being very, very thick and while there is some translucency, mostly that light is being absorbed very soon after it goes beyond that surface. And you can see the light on the surface. You can see how essentially that subsurface scattering is a gradient that moves slightly beyond the surface, and that's it. Now compare that against the low density subsurface scattering. Low density allows the light to just shoot right through there, but it is scattering it the whole time. Essentially you end up with a gradient much like the first example that I showed you. The light passes all the way through the whole thing. When I turn off the surface effects, you can see that, that gradient is fairly simple. There's a stronger change in color as that light passes more and more through the surface, but essentially you just end up with the surface effects on top of a larger light gradient. With a glassy surface, you end up with what I showed in the second example, where the light is concentrated on the opposite side from where the light is hitting the surface. And as I turn off the surface effects, you can see that that creates a reverse gradient from what we saw in the low density. And there's actually a whole gradient between low density and glassy surfaces that allow that light to pass through but don't have quite as much glassiness, so you can have anywhere in between all of these. And as I turn on those surface effects, you can see that the whole thing holds up pretty well as though that light is passing through without too much resistance. One thing with glassy surfaces is that because there's so much light passing through unhindered, it doesn't usually look very good when you put a lot of reflection on that surface. So in order to make this one look a little bit better, I have to turn down the opacity, the brightness of the light bouncing off the surface, and often you'll also have an increase in the amount of specular reflections. With variable density surfaces, you can get any of these effects all combined together, 
and it often happens as a result of denser things in the center, veins that go through on the edges, different color variations that happen, even changes in the glassiness of an object can happen across a surface. And you'll see as I turn that off, it's basically just getting darker around those edges. I used a very soft edged brush so that you could see those effects are actually subsurface effects and not painting that's happening on the surface so that when you turn on all those effects, it all works together. Now these layers that I painted on top are actually screen layers. You could use lighten layers, but a screen or a lighten layer is going to add the light on top of everything. Make sure that when you're painting subsurface effects that you use additive layer types, such as a screen or a lighten. Otherwise it's not going to look correct. Sometimes those surfaces can get too bright though. If you are using a lot of screen lighting, or a lot of layers on top of each other that have that additive effect. So if that's the case, you just have to make sure that what's underneath isn't too bright so that the layers that you put on top look correct. When you look over all of these, you may notice that while the objects themselves look pretty good, they don't look like they're fitting into the environment very well. This one's probably the closest. And what's missing is because you have light transmitting through these objects, that needs to be affecting the shadow in some way. Most shadow effects are going to be very subtle. This high density, subsurface scattering results in a very subtle shift, a slight glow in that color around those edges and not very much in the shadow. It's mostly bouncing out away from where that light is happening. With the low density surface on the other hand, you end up with a much stronger light which spreads throughout. Once again, much darker than the object itself, but it's going to be affecting most of the shadow now. On a glassy surface, you get something almost like a caustic effect, although maybe not as concentrated. It's much like the low density effect, except you get a lot of light concentrated through the shadow, and now not as much around the edges. With a variable density surface, whatever is changing that density needs to be reflected in the shadows. If it goes glassy, it's going to have a caustic effect. If it goes to low density or high density, then you are going to have the appropriate amount of light transmitting through it. And because variable density can get so complicated, I want to show an example that can help break this down and make it a little bit more easy to figure out. So if it helps, instead of thinking about all of the interactions that are happening inside the surface, just imagine that once that light ray hits the surface, it's going to scatter some random direction. And if you can imagine an individual light ray hitting that surface, it can go any of these directions. We'll count all of those directions and you can see how that creates a brighter concentration of possibilities here and a much lower concentration of possibilities here. Now imagine that that light is landing everywhere on that surface and how it's going to scatter from there. And you can see as you look at those light rays crisscrossing over each other, how it is that we end up with that soft gradient effect to the light. That reflects exactly what's happening to those light rays here. So what happens if we introduce something very dense inside, like a pit in the center of a peach or a nectarine? If you take that one light ray example, you can imagine all of the directions that that light ray goes, and in the center of that we have an object blocking so that there is a shadow on the backside from that one light's position. I imagine tons and tons of little packets of light hitting this thing all from the same direction, and each one is going to have its own shadow as a result of that, and so when you add them all together, you end up with a generalized, very soft shadow with that peach pit in the center. And you can see how when that is applied here, it looks like sort of a softened, generalized shadow in the center. Notice how important those surface effects are in selling the idea of that peach pit or that dense thing right in the center of this fruit. So what happens if we move this peach pit maybe a little bit closer to the edge? Well, the light rays all come out from the same places, but now they have a harder time reaching into that corner where this peach pit is right next to the edge now. And if you see that, you can see the more generalized effect and you can see the more concentrated effect here. And this one actually has a little bit stronger edges, whereas this one's a lot softer. And if you understand that, you can paint any subsurface effect and add variability to it based on the softness or hardness of those edges. So I want to show a quick example of how to apply all of these principles in context of a painting. As you can see, I've already applied the ambient light and the key light and the cast shadow. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make this feel like a stick of coconut oil or maybe lard that is melting at the bottom and I'm painting that subsurface scattering using a warmer color that's maybe more pure to the true color of this surface as the light bounces throughout it. And even though it's getting quite translucent down at the bottom, I don't imagine that it's going to get to the point where you would actually see the bar clearly through the center of it. It would all be subsurface scattering. And I'll stop there. I hope this demo is very helpful and you'll go forth and paint beautiful subsurface scattering. Thank you for watching. Learn about the intricacies of light and surface from games industry veteran Sam Nielsen. Over a course of nine lessons, Sam will show you how to achieve more realistic rendering in virtually any situation through techniques based on physical properties of light and matter. He'll talk in detail about different types of light sources and how to combine them, as well as shadows, reflection, the interaction of light with different materials, and much more on Schoolism.com.